Let me pray for us as we look at God's word together now. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We pray that as you speak to us now about your king, your kingdom, and how we can be part of it, that we would listen carefully and obey what your king commands. Amen. Well, last week in his introduction to Mark, Pete helpfully talked about the two big questions that Mark is looking to answer in his book. One, who is Jesus? And two, why did he come? And Mark's gospel is not a slow burner. It's like a fast-paced TV drama. Last week, we looked at the first 13 verses where Mark told us that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And then he showed how Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet, John the Baptist, and even God himself testify that Jesus is God's King. And despite introducing us briefly to John the Baptist, Mark quickly moves on. He is now in prison, verse 14, and it's Jesus who takes centre stage. Again, Mark moves quickly. He gives no backstory about Jesus' birth and family history or childhood. He is just straight in with his teaching in verse 14. And Mark wants us to know, God's king has come, so repent and believe. God's king has come, so repent and believe. Before we look at Jesus' words, let me just try and set the scene. At this point, Jesus didn't have any of his disciples around him. He hadn't achieved celebrity status yet, as he hasn't begun his public ministry. So you've probably got a usual sunny afternoon in Galilee with people picnicking, kids climbing trees, people walking past chatting, some joggers. And all of a sudden, Jesus starts to preach. And in verse 15, he says, the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. You may have heard some street preachers in Barnsley who preach as people go about their shopping. And most of the time, as I've observed, most people just ignore them. But to first century Jewish picnickers, Jesus' words would have probably made them drop their cheese and ham sandwiches and spit out their lemonade. People walking past would have nudged each other. Hey, did you hear that? Whoa! Well, why would they have responded that way? What's so significant about what Jesus says? Firstly, it's significant because many people would have heard John the Baptist preach. So they may already be thinking, hmm, something's happening, something's going on, something's different because John had done his warm-up act for Jesus so well. And it's also hugely significant because the kingdom of God was what the Jews were waiting for and had been for hundreds and hundreds of years. They were waiting for God's king to come, the Christ, because a kingdom is ruled by a king. Everyone that heard Jesus say in that brief little sermon, the time has come, they would have all been through Jewish Sunday school. They would have heard all the promises that God gives in the Old Testament about his coming king. Promises that spoke of good news like Isaiah 52 verse 7. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation. Promises like Zechariah 14 verse 9 that speak of God ruling as king. The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day there will be one Lord and his name the only name. Promises of what life will be like in the future under God's king like Ezekiel 37. My servant David will be king over them and they will have one shepherd. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. That's just three. There are many, many more that God gave in the Old Testament to tell his people that a day is coming in the future when my king will come and he will rule. And Jesus is saying here, that day is now. That day has come. That day is here. And it's good news because the king has come. And he has a message for people. He has a message and we see it at the rest in the rest of verse 15 repent and believe the good news repent and believe the good news jesus says there are two things to do in order to become a part of the kingdom the first is to repent now i think a lot of people have a view of repentance that is like making a slight adjustment on the steering wheel of your life The direction of travel in life remains the same, but 
Yeah, I guess I should repent of swearing. I'll try that little tweak or I'll stop drinking so much. I'll do a little bit of a tweak there. But the direction of travel, what you want in life, where you're heading remains the same. We're still heading for towards the village of pleasure or the town of success or the city of popularity. That's not what repentance really means. That's not what Jesus is getting at. Repentance is not a tweak of the wheel. It's actually a violent U-turn. It's a full-scale grab of the wheel and turning it as fast as possible so that your direction of travel is the opposite direction. You have turned completely. You have a different destination in mind. Now living for God, he is at the centre, not me. And this is radical because by nature, every single one of us is self-centered. We think that the world revolves around us. Just think how much of the past week we have thought about ourselves. How am I feeling? How will I enjoy myself? What are others thinking of me? I can't believe they said about that about me. Am I appreciated? Am I popular? Am I happy? On and on and on we go with the self-absorption that leaves us constantly dissatisfied and insecure. And Jesus says, repent, turn around from living for self and live for God. And this means that he becomes the centre of our world, not us. But repentance is only one side of the coin. Jesus also says, believe the good news. Believe the good news. The good news at this point for his first hearers is that the king of God's kingdom has come. The one who God had promised would rule eternally. The one who God promised would bring God's people back into perfect relationship with him. The one who God promised would bring the power of the Holy Spirit to help his people to repent and to love and trust and obey him. Believe the good news that I am that king. That's what Jesus is saying. And we have the blessing over the coming months as we go through Mark's gospel to see more of what believe in this good news means. The good news of a king who gives us glimpses at what living in his kingdom will be like when he comes again as he heals the sick, drives out evil. The good news of a king who came not to be served but to give his life and die on a cross. The good news of a king who through his death offers us forgiveness a restored relationship with God. The good news of a king who came back to life and offers eternal life to all who will believe his message of good news. To believe is to put your trust in this king, Jesus. It is to receive the good news with gratitude. If you're not a Christian, this is how you become one. It is to repent it is to perform that U-turn, to turn from living for self, to say sorry to God and to turn back to him and start to live with him as your Lord. It is to believe the good news that Jesus is the king of God's kingdom and through his death and resurrection offers us a place in the kingdom. Now when you hear good news, it's natural to react to it, isn't it? If we were told about a vaccine for coronavirus, I'm sure we would all be delighted and we would go and receive the vaccine when we were offered it. Or if someone gave you a winning lottery ticket, you would be delighted, but you would also go and make the claim. The news of God's king who brings God's kingdom is way better than any other news, but it requires a response. Repent and believe. If you are a Christian, repentance and belief is not just the beginning of the Christian life, it is the Christian life. See, the steering wheel of our hearts is always turning back towards self-centeredness. We need to keep turning it each day towards Jesus. Our hearts are prone to wander, prone to leave the God that we love. But it's also crucial that we remember that Jesus' message is good news. It's good news of a king who welcomes people, who forgives people, who loves his people. So repentance and belief is the daily march of a Christian. Left foot belief. Thank you, Lord, 
that my king loves me and died for me to give me a place in your kingdom. Right foot, repent. Help me, Lord, to love you. Help me to live for you in my home, in my workplace, with my family, when I'm online, when I'm at the pub, when I'm watching the match. Repent and believe, repent and believe, repent and believe. The two work together. Lose one and we will hobble or hop and we won't get anywhere. Ignore repentance and our lives won't change. Ignore belief and we will be moral but lack assurance and lack joy. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. God's king has come. Repent and believe. Next, God's king has come, so follow him. God's king has come, so follow him. Now, we might expect Jesus to recruit the great and the good in Jewish society. Influential people, clever people, famous people, rich people. Surely they would be his first picks for the kingdom. But as he starts recruiting followers, members of his kingdom, he heads to the beach, to the Sea of Galilee. That's where he's going to make his first picks. Verse 16 tells us that Simon, who will later be known as Peter, and Andrew were fishermen. Now these men weren't the cream of the crop of Jewish society. They were ordinary working class men. And Jesus says to them in verse 17, Come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And we are told that at once they left their nets and followed him. They didn't even tidy away their nets. They didn't say, hang on a minute, I've got to sell the business and then I've probably got to sell my house and then I'll join up Jesus. Just give me a few weeks, few months. No, the call of Jesus, the authority of his words, follow me. And they were enough. They listen and they obey his call to follow. But Jesus wasn't finished there. He carries on a little farther and calls James and John. They left their father in the boat with the hired men and followed Jesus. You can just imagine Zebedee, Zebedee, their dad, in the boat. Here, John, will you give me a hand, will you? John? John? And he looks up and they're gone. James and John hear Jesus' words to follow him. They listen and obey. This is what repentance and belief looks like. They turn from their lives lived for self and they direct their lives towards Jesus. They believe the good news that he is the king of God's kingdom and become some of the founding members. The lives of these men were never the same again. Now, it doesn't mean that we will all leave our jobs when we become Christians, but think again about our travelling in a car image. We thought about how a U-turn is repentance. And the great thing about Jesus calling people to follow him is that he leads the way. He is the car in front. He never had to repent because he always loved and trusted God with all his heart. So as we look to him, we follow his lead. But we will fail. There will be bumps in the road and we'll see that through Mark's gospel from Jesus' first followers. There will be times when we're tempted to turn back or take the next exit. Oh, it's too hard. I'm suffering. But we must remember the good news. Our king has come. He promises the destination is incredible and he will lead us there. And he also tells his first followers what he will make them into. Fishers of men, verse 17. That means that they were to join Jesus in declaring the good news of the kingdom and how people could be a part of it by repenting and believing. So too for us. Just as we follow him in loving and living for God, we follow him in sharing the good news. The rest of our passage this morning and the rest of the chapter, as we'll see next week, is Mark giving us evidence that Jesus really is God's king And so following him is a no-brainer. Jesus takes his followers to Capernaum and he begins to preach. He begins to teach. But this was no ordinary sermon. Just look at the reaction of those who heard it in verse 22. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. 
Jesus' listeners in the synagogue were amazed, mouths open, stunned silence, as they heard someone teach with such authority. The teachers of the law would have taught them each week, often quoting the authority of past teachers. But here is someone teaching from his own authority. To teach with authority is to be an expert in a subject. Jesus, as God's king and son, is an expert in everything because he is the creator. He's an expert in humanity. He made us. He knows us. He knows what's wrong with us all. He knows why there's evil and suffering. And he offers a cure and a solution. He's an expert in God's kingdom and how we can be a part of it. He teaches with authority because he is God, the absolute authority. So it's crucial when we listen that we listen carefully and humbly and practically. That means we look to do what he says. We've already seen the power of his words in calling the first disciples to follow him. And we get another example of the power of his words at the end of the passage. Have a look at verse 23. Just then, a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. A man possessed by an evil spirit is maybe something that we are unfamiliar with. But we read about it a number of times in the Gospels. Satan's tactics today are more subtle, not as in your face and obvious. But when Jesus came, Satan's demons broke their cover and they come out in force. And just imagine being this man possessed, not feeling as if you were in control of your own body or your own words. It must have been awful. No doubt it left him in difficulty trying to find work, relating to his family and his friends. His life would have been ruined by this evil spirit. And the evil spirit immediately recognises Jesus. It calls Jesus the Holy One of God and Jesus speaks in verse 25. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. And the evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. Jesus speaks to the spirit, and incredibly, the evil spirit comes out of the man. It shakes him and shrieks as it leaves, leaving no one in any doubt what has just happened. Just imagine what this would have meant for the man. The relief of his family, the possibility of work, of a family, of life. There is more going on than Jesus just being incredibly kind to this man. Jesus is showing here his authority over evil. Remember, Mark's aim is to show us that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He's laying out his evidence in front of us. The first piece of the evidence is Jesus' authority over evil. This backs up Jesus' claim that the kingdom of God is near, a kingdom where there will be no more evil. Now, I wonder if you've ever been to a food festival or a food market. I would recommend, although it is extremely difficult, choosing which stall to go to. At a food festival, a lot of the stalls offer you samples. Try this, hoping that you will then go and buy the real thing. And this miracle that Jesus does and the ones that follow in Mark are giving us little tasters of what the kingdom of God will be like when Jesus comes again. His miracles should amaze us as they do the watching crowd in verse 27. But they should also whet our appetites for the coming kingdom of God. In that place, evil will be done away with for good. That's what we have to look forward to. That will be the end of the journey for us as Christians. So keep going. Keep fixing your eyes on Jesus in front. Follow him in that daily pattern, in that daily march of repentance and belief, repentance and belief. We haven't backed the wrong horse. We aren't wasting our lives. Jesus really is the Christ, the one who brings God's kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we praise you that the time came for you to send Jesus, the king of your kingdom, into the world. 
We praise you that this is good news. We praise you, Jesus, that you have ultimate authority over people in your teaching and over evil. Thank you, Father, for showing us these things this morning. Please, would they help us to continue to follow Jesus more confidently, more joyfully, more wholeheartedly in the week ahead. May we follow him in repentance and belief. Amen. Well, our final song this morning is Amazing Grace. We once were lost, but now we have been found by our King Jesus. What good news. Let's celebrate as we sing together Amazing Grace. <laughs>